It wouldn't be a week of hardware news and the recap thereof without a lot of NVIDIA and AMD news. And we have that for this week. So NVIDIA has added Samsung memory to its roster for video cards. And the internet seems to be jumping to the conclusion that therefore all micron memory must be bad. But that's not actually why NVIDIA added the memory to the roster of board components or to the bill of materials. Also, NVIDIA driver fixes for most of the BSODs we've been seeing. Uh, we have an update on days without RTX and games. And AMD with their very many news announcements for GPUs and CPUs alike. Before that, this video is brought to you by Corsair's Vengeance RGB Memory. Corsair's Vengeance RGB RAM uses pre-screened ICs for better overclocking headroom and tighter timings. Corsair's RAM also has the benefit of wide-reaching motherboard support by landing on qualified vendor lists for motherboard makers, ensuring wide compatibility between boards. Learn more at the link in the description below. First up, NVIDIA adding Samsung memory to its bill of materials for its video cards for the RTX series. This includes partners as well. A lot of the board partners, when they buy the reference PCB and or the GPU from NVIDIA, they will also purchase the memory from NVIDIA after NVIDIA purchased it from their memory suppliers. So Samsung memory is getting a lot of spread here. And because of the artifacting issues that have been discussed online, it's not actually widespread at this moment, uh, but because it appears to be widespread from the discussion online, a lot of the conclusions drawn are that, well, if Samsung is being used now, then Micron must be bad. In reality, it is possible for, of course, some of the Micron memory to have been bad, maybe a bad batch or something where we haven't confirmed anything yet. But the reality is this happens all the time. It's adding another supplier so that demand can be met with supply of the video card. So this is not abnormal. It's every single GPU launch, including with Vega even, as the, uh, as the memory supply comes to fruition because it's a new type of memory, it's GDDR6, it's not readily available, uh, the additional suppliers will come to market and supply the video card makers with their memory. So this is not, it's a bit of jumping to conclusions, a bit of misconception, but uh, it is possible for a bad batch of Micron to have ended up on the cards, as we said, but also Samsung being added doesn't mean that literally all Micron cards are bad. Just as some anecdotal evidence, we have about 12 review sample 20 series cards, and all of them, I think, have Micron. There might be one that's Samsung, but certainly almost all of them are Micron. None of them have had exhibited any issues, uh, whereas we have basically an equivalent amount of cards from you all on loan that are artifacting or experiencing other issues, and those also have Micron. So uh, some anecdotal evidence for you, but not all of them are bad, clearly. Either way, though, Samsung's being added doesn't necessarily mean anything. We'll see. Sometimes the memory might be capable of higher speeds from one supplier versus another, but they should all meet the baseline spec speed. And it's primarily overclocking where that'll really matter. Also in NVIDIA news is the driver update that fixes a lot of the BSODs and some multi-monitor issues. So just before NVIDIA's newest driver release, we confirmed that BSODs were largely occurring from things like using G-Sync displays, using high refresh displays, using high refresh displays with G-Sync especially, and uh, also multi-monitor configurations were causing various issues. So these have largely been fixed. Uh, about 24 hours after our first video, NVIDIA had already been working on a driver at the point we posted the video, of course. They posted driver version 416.81, which resolves several of the multi-monitor related issues, including the following. Multi-monitor idle power draw is very high. That was one of the fixes. Blue screen crashes when exiting games while using both a G-Sync and non-G-Sync monitor synchronously. Mouse cursor causing FPS to go out of sync with windowed G-Sync. Flickering in The Witcher 3. And then not listed are multivarious other BSOD issues, including those involving high refresh displays. We have seen some of the BSOD issues that we validated disappear with this patch. So if you're still seeing them, post your monitor model below and any information related to the blue screen of death that you might be experiencing or CTDs, because this is a hard issue to validate, as we said originally. Uh, it is, it, it's a bit spurious. It seems to not be 100% consistent when BSODs will occur on the RTX cards. Some people have reported that their Titan Vs are showing similar issues. So this is a, a driver level issue, not a hardware level issue as far as we're aware. So it should be resolved as driver updates keep going out. And if you still have BSODs after updating, post information below about your system config and what's causing the blue screen. And then we'll send that along to NVIDIA if they need any additional help on it. Uh, so as far as other testing goes, we'll have already at this point a live stream up. So we're going to be live streaming some of our testing 
of the 20 series cards that were sent to us, some of the defective ones, artifacting issues. Uh, we'll be working on things like uh, memory downclocking, power target changes, maybe some disassembly, some thermal testing of memory, stuff like that. And before that stream, we had already validated about nine FE cards with artifacting. During the stream, which will have already happened at this point, uh, we will have tested memory frequencies, power targets, and done some disassembly of cards to find common threads potentially. And of course, I mean, there's, there's your future perfect tense with a mix of subjunctive mood for the week. Next up, days without RTX and games. 51 or thereabouts, depending on when this video goes up. So we interrupt this program to update the ticker on days without RTX in games. And at 51, Shadow of the Tomb Raider was supposed to have RTX features when it launched, or close to launch, and it does not presently have those. Uh, Battlefield 5 just shipped, does not have RTX features, and including DLSS for any of the games that are supposed to have those. So it's still a tech demo right now. And this is largely because NVIDIA and the game developers are still waiting on that big Windows patch, which might come back out eventually after it's done deleting everyone's files, if you didn't hear about that. So once that patch comes out for Windows 10, the next big update, we should maybe start seeing some RTX enablement in games. That's been a big holdup right now and a, a limitation for what can be turned on because NVIDIA does leverage some of the Microsoft features coming out in that patch for their RTX uh, game SDK. So, uh, so that's it for that one. We're still waiting on games for it, basically. But next one, 7 nanometer Rome CPUs and Zen 2. This is an AMD news item. AMD has formally announced their second generation Epic lineup, currently named Rome. Rome is based on a 7 nanometer process. It follows the Naples launch of Epic last year. And it's also got Zen 2 microarchitecture. It offers up to 64 cores and 128 threads, roughly targeting twice the performance per socket of previous Epic CPUs. In addition to a new architecture and manufacturing process, AMD is deploying a new chip design approach with Rome. AMD calls this approach, quote, chiplets, whereby AMD uses multiple 7 nanometer Zen 2 CPU dies, all connected to a separate 14 nanometer I.O. die. AMD's latest generation of Infinity Fabric will interconnect the chiplets and the I.O. die, as well as new memory controllers housed in the I.O. die. This new approach largely appears to make manufacturing simpler for AMD, and importantly, it's less costly. In regards to chips and interfaces, not everything scales equally with a process shrink. Reducing die size, though, required to make one monolithic die and instead making several smaller dies should mean better yields and lower cost. The new Epic CPUs will be the first CPUs to adopt PCIe 4.0. No present word on availability or public pricing, but AMD is working on sampling select customers and markets. Just as a shoe in here, we're going to be seeing a lot more of this multi-chip module approach to design going forward as monolithic wafers get difficult to make. The bigger the die, the more expensive it is to make, the lower the yield, which also increases the cost because you have more silicon that you're throwing away and more time you're spending on the fabrication line. So MCMs will probably become a bit of a thing going forward, including for Intel apparently. And NVIDIA has also published white papers on its own thoughts on MCMs for GPUs in the future. So 7 nanometer Vega GPUs, let's get through some of the rest of the AMD news here for the week. AMD also announced the first 7 nanometer GPUs that it's working on, and these are the form of Radeon Instinct. They are the MI50 and MI60 video cards or GPUs. These are not going to be consumer targeted devices. These are also enterprise cards. They are used for things like deep learning, machine learning, and high compute workloads, maybe some cloud computing in there as well. The new Radeon Instinct cards are based on TSMC's seven nanometer FinFET process and AMD's Vega 20 architecture. The MI60, just as reference, will only use or only support Linux. So it is very much a, a scientific grade or server grade card, depending on what you want to do on it. And like the new Epic CPUs, these new Radeon Instinct cards will be the first to adopt the new PCIe 4.0 standard. The MI50 and MI60 can also be interconnected via AMD's Infinity Fabric Link, allowing multiple GPUs in a single server. The cards are slated to launch in November uh, on November 18th, and there's no word yet on pricing or availability. We have seen some of those Vega GPUs appear as just the code names in some benchmarks, but uh, keep in mind that this is not meant to be used as a gaming device. Seasonic raising MSRP. Seasonic announced that effective December 1st, 2018, all of their China-built power supplies will see a price increase 
in U.S. markets. This follows along with some of the tariffs we've been talking about lately. Seasonic attributes these price increases to what they call, quote, recent market developments, stopping short of saying the word tariff. And the China-U.S. tariff war has been setting the stage for some time now on price increases for computer components. Now, one thing that does dodge these is, uh, is memory and SSDs. If you look through the whole list, that the, uh, the whole U.S. tariffs list, memory is not on there, SSD is not on there. So that benefits us, I guess, in one way because they've been coming down in price a bit. But other components, things that can be considered uh, DIY components for more core audience. So you have cases, video cards, motherboards, power supplies, of course, uh, devices like that. Those are impacted. And the China-U.S. Uh, tariff changes will be affecting Seasonic among the first in the uh, official MSRP adjustment department. So looking at the affected SKUs, they have a list of them. Price increases range from $10 to $20, and to many, this won't be an insignificant amount, especially at the low end, it becomes sort of non-linear the way it scales. Seasonic maintains that the solution is dynamic and will be adjusted accordingly. So if the tariffs increase or decrease, so too will the price hikes. Also announcing a new server CPU, not to be outdone, Intel has announced its newest line of Cascade Lake Xeons. And the new Cascade Lake Xeon AP, or Advanced Performance, as the initialism means, these CPUs are based on MCP or multi-chip package designs following suit of Epic, and it offers up to 48 cores and 96 threads with support for 12 DDR4 memory channels. Big move there on the memory channel support. And this is kind of interesting because we don't typically say like AMD did. It's been a while since AMD has been in a market-leading position. And to be first with a design that is now being adopted elsewhere by Intel here uh, is, is critical for AMD's ongoing, hopefully, success as they try to challenge the CPU market segment. And really, what we need to see now is some challenging in the GPU market because uh, any company holding as much market share as Intel and NVIDIA have in the past does lead to things like stricter policies with how media is approached, for example, st stuff we do and work with. So anyway, the design eschews the monolithic die approach of the current Xeons in favor of a multi-chip approach, multiple chips and dies on one package, and Cascade Lake will have in-silicon mitigations for Spectre and Meltdown. This is important. It's one of the first architectures that will have in-silicon mitigations, not just firmware and microcode updates. And we currently are unsure of other specifications for the CPU. So of course the new Cascade Lake chips are based on Intel's 14 nanometer process as 10 nanometer isn't ready yet. And it won't be probably until 2019. The 10 nanometer Ice Lake Xeons likely won't be here till 2020 following Intel's present roadmap. And that leaves Cascade Lake as Intel's stalwart defender in the server space against the AMD Epic CPUs although Intel has been doing still just fine in the server space and in the desktop space. They have a lot of market share. Port smash and side channel attacks being discussed lately. So just as Spectre and Meltdown are being cleaned up, researchers have found another vulnerability called port smash. Port smash is a side channel attack that targets CPUs using SMT technology, which is basically all mainstream CPUs. And that includes both Intel and AMD alongside others like ARM, but Intel calls theirs hyperthreading, AMD calls theirs SMT. It's kind of a brand name versus a generic name thing. Same idea though, port smash requires malicious code to be running in parallel with a legitimate process on the same CPU core. Then through SMT or hyperthreading, the malicious code being executed on one thread can eavesdrop and leak bits of encrypted data from another thread, allowing an attacker to receive the encrypted data and reconstruct it. The researchers, who are based out of Finland and Cuba, said they do not believe this exploit is unique to Intel. In fact, side channel attacks aren't even unique to CPUs. Researchers at the University of California at Riverside have successfully exploited NVIDIA GPUs as well with side attacks. And in the case of GPUs, these attacks can be used to monitor web activity and steal passwords. The researchers are currently delivering their findings to NVIDIA, who will be rolling out a patch to address the side channel attacks and vulnerabilities. Researchers are also in contact with both AMD and Intel talking about their findings to see if their respective GPUs can be affected in a similar way to NVIDIA's. The research group now plans to test these side channel attacks with Android phones. Coming up next, and we'll keep an eye on that story because that would be a, a, certainly a big one since phones are largely perceived by users to be impenetrable for viruses and malware. That's obviously not the case. SK Hynix launches 4D NAND, playing 4D chess with the other manufacturers. So SK Hynix announced its 96 layer 4D NAND. It's called 4D. 
not because it exists in four dimensions, like you would think it would mean, it's because they use CTF, or Charge Trap Flash, with Puck. Not that one. It's periphery undersell. SK Hynix uses this approach as compared to the 3D floating gate design, and SK Hynix claims that this is a first and calls their new memory, again, 4D NAND. Following, of course, 3D NAND, but there was never a brand name 2D NAND. I guess that would be planar. SK Hynix's new 4D NAND will allow chips to be 30% smaller. That's the big thing here. And that also allows them to increase density and yield considerably, thereby supporting better prices. SK Hynix plans to use 4D NAND to power 1 terabyte SSDs with in-house controller designs by the... Uh, end of the year, with enterprise designs slated for 2019. Short one here, the Corsair Vengeance 5180 gaming PC. Corsair's rolling out a new fully built gaming PC option, something that doesn't excite a lot of our audience, but worth keeping an eye on. So Corsair is in a bit of a unique position when it comes to pre-builds, because they can provide most of the components. In fact, in this one, Corsair's got 9 out of 13 of the components listed, made for the Vengeance 5180. It also uses IQ, of course, the proprietary interface software. So Vengeance 5180 will have an i7-8700 non-K. It will also be using a B360 motherboard because it's a non-K CPU, I suppose. Uh, an RTX 2080 and an undisclosed 2 terabyte hard drive option. It'll also have a copy of Windows 10, of course. So the 5180, if you're curious, will be sell sold for $2,400 and is available now, though. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to know how it performs, you just look at any of those individual components for benchmarks. And then also, Corsair News, the Hydro X series has been more fully detailed. It's been teased several times by Corsair at this point. It's been pushed back. Launches have been delayed for this one. But this is Corsair's open-loop water cooling solution. Following the acquisition of several top talent members from EK Waterblocks previously, so Corsair teased the Hydro X series at a gaming event in Paris and also had information suggesting a CES announcement for uh, 2019. That'd be just a couple months from now. The leaked images show a CPU block, a GPU block, and a reservoir and pump combination. Corsair has been working on entering the custom water cooling market for some time after, again, acquisition of former EK talent. And their foray into custom loops was only a matter of time. Corsair's been teasing HydroX on their website, including one video that was like just the letter X made out of water or something like that. So pretty obvious what they were going to eventually release. And they also updated the teaser to show water blocks for the new NVIDIA RTX 20 series cards. And since then, there's been no mention of other products in the Hydro X lineup. So we'll have to keep an eye out for CES to learn more. That's it for this hardware news recap. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help out there. We'll see you all next time.